When I think about the times in my life that I didn't allow a high standard, I can recall the pain it brought too. When I allowed myself to date a man who was verbally abusive, I allowed that to be the level of intimacy I received. When I accepted being severely underpaid for a key consulting job where I wasn't paid for months and still haven't been, I set a low standard for attracting finances. When I accepted a chef that could cook well but who I knew didn't have the integrity I desire, I allowed a difficult situation to unfold. In these situations, I accepted lower standards and it caused suffering. And let's be clear, this isn't about anyone else. This was about me not allowing myself to live to a better standard in these areas. I've come to recognize that having high standards is part of my drive. It fuels my passion. Yes, it can be exhausting for me and for others, but I think that's also the natural growth in life. Every time we get to a place and realize we've set a new standard that we've been desiring, we then automatically think of more or a higher standard to attain. Why shouldn't we have the level of intimacy, love, and deep spiritual connection in a partner in the way I want? Why shouldn't we all have the financial freedom we so desire? Why shouldn't we be healthy and strong and nourished? Why shouldn't our living conditions be the most peaceful and safe spaces we desire? Why shouldn't we have a career that's on our terms? And the beautiful thing is that my high standard is different to the next person. So there's enough in this wonderful world for us all to have all that we desire at the highest standards we desire. So when someone says to me, your standards are too high, I turn and say, dang straight they are. I care enough about myself to have extraordinary standards because I want an extraordinary life. Boom. And with that being read, welcome back to the 127 Fit Podcast. Today's guest is the founder and foodie of Just Be Kitchen in Denver, Colorado. Just Be Kitchen is the first gluten, grain, and refined sugar-free, fast, casual restaurant. Today's guest is Jen Peters. Jen, welcome to the 127 Fit Podcast. Thank you so much. And I had forgotten I had written that. So. No, that's cool. I got I got it off your website and I, I really liked it. So I thought that would be a good way to introduce you and um, introduce the the 127 Fit Podcast guest to you. So Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I really enjoyed that writing. So um, we are going to uh, start off today's um, podcast, Jen, talking about positivity. I noticed that um, when I walked in, there's um, definitely a positive vibe to your restaurant. There's also some positive um, statements and quotes on the walls and um, con- contacting, connecting with some other people that really appreciate your restaurant. I know that's something that I've heard is that there's just a, a positive vibe. There's a lot of positivity in this place, which is very attractive to people. Thank you. So how how is positivity an important, integral part in your own personal life? And then how how do you try to manifest that positivity within your business of, of Just Be Kitchen? Boom, right out of the gate. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to start off hot, yep. <laughs> um, so I remember about, I don't know, like five, six years ago, reading Eat, Pray, Love by Liz Gilbert. Okay. And she has this amazing quote in there that says, um, happiness is a choice. It's not something that's just, I, I'm, I'm not saying the quote exactly how she's written it but she the context is that happiness is a choice and it's not something that you're either lucky enough to have or unlucky enough to have it's not something that's bought or um uh broken basically that that you can be happy and you have to keep choosing to be happy right so i remember reading that and going yeah that's so true like it, and she also talks about how you have to fight for it. Like, you have to constantly fight to, to be happy. Like, there's going to be things in life all the time that are 
trying to pull, like not necessarily trying but like that are going to pull you down or that are going to get you down or that you could easily focus on right so i just think of I, that's really stuck with me and that like i choose my choice is to be happy my choice is joy so i'm always going to try to choose joy that doesn't mean that i feel joyful all the time exactly. or positive all the time or happy all the time but i know that that's ultimately what's going to keep me living to my highest self is choosing that joy. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So your positivity, your, your positivity and how you carry your life is going to spill over to the people that you hire, your, your employees, and then your customers as well, correct? I would like to think so. I mean, it's hard. Yeah, I don't, right. I, you know, I mean, I... I, that's like an ultimate goal, isn't it, of everyone? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but I don't get it right all the time. Yeah. I, I certainly don't. You know, and and actually, I think that I'm more ingrained to be a half glass empty person. But it's because I'm very analytical, so I'll always look at like what's missing mm -hmm. before. So I've had to really train myself to think about what, like, everything that's there. Right. right. I've really tr had to train myself through journaling and gratitude journal and whatnot but yes I would love to think I would hope that you know my approach to things has a has an effect on mm -hmm. others uh, I, I I don't personally know you you don't personally know me but I know that everything always starts with the boss the CEO the founder the leader any anybody that's in that position like myself being a school teacher I know that the attitude that I carry into my classroom and the way that that I carry myself that's going to spill over to my students because they're they're looking they're looking up to me in one form or fashion now they're just because I'm super positive and I'm a certain way that doesn't mean all the the students or the kids are going to be that way but I know that you know if I carry myself a certain way and have certain expectations and have that positivity in my life and in the classroom that is going to have an effect on my students and sure. so I know even though we don't necessarily personally know each other I know that your positivity and your striving each day to be positive will definitely be manifested through your employees and through your restaurant because again talking to some people that have been here they they appreciate the the, the positivity and so you, Good, you are you are you are um portraying that and 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 being a leader in, in that area just just so you know well, <laughs> i i hear it from people that that, that have come in here so Great. definitely keep that up because i know in my life um, Jen, positivity is, it's its everything because you said it, you hit the nail right on the head about, you know, choice. Like we have a choice every single day of who we're going to be, how we're going to act, how we're going to respond, who we're going to become. Like, yeah, we're going to have a lot of negativity around us maybe. There's going to be always negative people. There's always going to be crazy things going on. But we have the choice every day to be positive and to be that example, that leader to be to be someone to follow, and so um, yeah, I just I want to say amen to to choosing because our life and our our destiny, it's it's in our hands, it's our choice. Yeah. We we got to go get it. So cool. So great way to start off. Now you did mention mention um, just a minute ago journaling. Let's let's talk about journaling um, and just how that positively impacts your life and what journaling means to you and just maybe that expression of, of writing. So I've always loved writing. I've always felt that, um, that I could communicate a lot of things better through my writing than I could through speaking. Um, and so when I, I mean, I've been journaling for probably about 10 years now and it takes so many different forms. Like I've, I've used it mostly when I've been in a place of suffering, mm -hmm. um, but it's now become something that I, I don't do it as daily as I used to since I own a business, but you know, I did it this morning and I looked, it had been like two weeks since I journaled and it just, I, I love the questions that I get or the answers that I get when I write down my questions. Mm -hmm. I love um, writing down the gratitude. It just changes my state. So it's been a great outlet for me personally and I found that although I'm not um, journaling as frequently as I, I use to daily journal I do find also that avenue in my blog being a way of kind of it, it's very therapeutic for absolutely me. yeah 
so with the with the journaling <clears throat> and the writing then is it easier for you because I know it is for me is it easier for you to express the feelings the emotions that are inside of you through writing as opposed to maybe sharing that with a with another individual yeah I think well I think that through my writing I have an easier time with going to places that I wouldn't necessarily communicate to right. others. I'm a pretty an open book when I'm communicating with other people, mm -hmm. but I go to places in my journaling because as I'm writing, I feel like the way journaling works often is that, you know, God, Buddha, nature, mm -hmm. like starts, you know, almost provides those answers for you in your head. So then you right. can start writing it again as you're, as you're writing it, you get more answers and then it cr creates more writing. So there's just like a deeper level I feel sometimes that I can get to in my writing. Cool, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So let's uh, let's transition into kind of uh, maybe if you don't mind sharing with the listeners, kind of like where you grew up and just kind of your journey into education in, in regards to like college and things like that. Kind of how you got your start because then I want to transition into maybe kind of the career and then how we got to Just Be Kitchen and, and you being an entrepreneur. So if you just maybe want to share a little bit of your background for the listener, that, yeah, would, that would be sure. great. Yeah, sure. I mean, I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. Okay. It's not like I woke up one day and thought that. Uh -huh. um, I grew up in Florida. I went to school, University of Florida, okay, Go Gators. Cool. Um, I then, um, I was in marketing and PR. And so I my first job was up in Boston and I just kind of upped and moved out there, mm -hmm. worked there for two years. And then, you know, I said to my boss, I want to travel overseas. And long story short, I got an opportunity to go over to London to open up um, my company's like headquarters there and worked. And so I've always been in like the corporate world or okay. agency world. Um, and it wasn't until I started Just Be that I A, became a business owner and B, came into this industry. Okay. So... I just I just realized I could do what I was doing for the rest of my life and make great money but feel like a piece of me was missing. Right. Or I could make no money initially as an entrepreneur right, right. and do something that I cared about. Exactly. And so that's that's kinda where I'm at. Okay. So did did you grow up um with your family, like your mom, your dad, things of that nature, maybe some close relatives that were in, in business or how did you, you kind know, of get that interest in, somebody in business? Somebody asked me this recently. My, my parents, before they separated, they owned like a interior design architectural firm okay. um, for a few years. But that wasn't a big part of my upbringing or anything like that. I don't really know. I, I decided at one point um, to go to MBA school and it was pretty cool seeing, you know, a lot of my colleagues in, with businesses of their own and whatnot. Um, but I still didn't necessarily think that I was going to be an entrepreneur. I, I, I really didn't. I went to MBA school because I definitely knew I wanted to do something different than I was doing. But I wasn't 100% sure that I wanted to start a business. In fact, I actually thought that I was going to go work for another big corporate. Right. But I was just going to have the backing of an, of an MBA around me and I was going to be able to do something. I actually thought I would be able to do something in consumer foods. So I just didn't. I just didn't think that I was going to own my own business. Right, right. So so the transformation or the transition from, you know, kind of the corporate business and, and, and that experience to an entrepreneur, that's just been something that's happened pretty recently pretty for recently, you, right? Pretty recently, last few years, yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah. what was the, I know you kind of mentioned earlier about doing what you love and what you're you know, uh, passion about it. Was that really the catalyst then that kind of got you to start moving from corporate business to maybe start thinking about, Hey, you know, I, I can make really good money. I can, I can make a great living doing this, but was it maybe like deep in your soul or in your heart, there was maybe a little bit of something missing or how, yeah, how does that kind of I, really, look? I really felt like I was, so I was working, I had gone from a big corporate to join a very small cottage business, okay. like lifestyle business. Mm -hmm. And the owner wanted me to help grow his business so he could retire and make a lot of money. And so I kind of made that jump. And at the same time, I was finishing my MBA. And there was a couple of things that were happening. One was that, you know, I made that jump to, for the first time, not working for a large corporate. 
And I did it because I thought, well, maybe it'll be different working for a smaller business. Mm -hmm. um, but what I really came to realize is the work that I was doing was kind of the same. It just was different doing it for a global organization right. than a smaller organization. And I really just didn't feel like the work that I was doing was meaningful. Like, I enjoyed working with my clients. I, It, it wasn't the, the topic or anything like that. I just, it just didn't feel like I was giving all of, I just didn't feel like I was living to my highest purpose right. doing right. it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started to kind of, you know, I started to kind of explore like other avenues that I could go. And in MBA school, you know, this is kind of the birth of Just Be Kitchen is we had to pitch different business concepts. And I have no idea where I came up with this. Mm -hmm. And I pitched it. It had a little bit of a different form. I was a vegan at the time, so it started as like a vegan idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed. And I got really into, it was as a class project, but I was just so into it. And I was loving it. And the sweet soul, Brad Bloom, who was the former CEO of Burger King, um, was an alumni of my my school and he was talking to us in the, in the confines of the class project and he just said I feel like you're so passionate about this that this might be something you want to do and I kind of you know I was like well that's kind of cool he thinks that right. and, and so I explored further conversations with him and it just kept snowballing you know and I think that's the way the universe works is you know when you really want something but you're even if you're lost and you're not sure where you're what, what direction to go in if you just take a little bit of action, it, you know, it supports you and there's momentum Absolutely. that's been, that's built from it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what happened. That's cool. Cause I, I just put a post on my personal Facebook page yesterday about, um, taking actionable steps each day. And when we take those actionable steps each day, those will create open doors of, of opportunity. And that's that's exactly what Brad Bloom said to me. He's like, look, Jen, I don't know where this is going to take you. So many restaurants fail, but I can promise you this. Doors will open along the way. Yeah. And I think that's the case. Like, it's, it's, it's better to go hardcore in a direction that may not be a direction that you end up staying in, but at least you're moving. Right. You can always pivot out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's so. beautiful. I No, I... I can't get too fired up myself because that's, you know, even even the this this podcast, I, I call it a, a side passion project. And, you know, there's just always, I, I guess I consider myself, I'm a very free-spirited individual and I'm, I'm a big dreamer. Mm. And I've, I've always just, like I've always told my mom and my dad, like, I will never be a slave to my job. I will never be, you know, I'll, I'll work my 40 hours. I'll do whatever I got to do to pay the bills. But I, I, there's so much more to life for me as an individual than just, you know, clocking in, clocking out, making a paycheck and, you know, really just on that, that job career grind. Like I, I want to live life. So as we pursue our, our passion or our passions and we put everything in there, yeah, you know, maybe we are going to have to live paycheck to paycheck for a while. Maybe we're going to have to work a, maybe a quote unquote dead end job or something like that. But if we, like you said, like full throttle, just everything that we have, pursue that passion, there are going to be opportunities that present themselves, right? I mean, totally. that's, that's, that's yeah. what you found, right? In your totally. life, Jen? Yeah. And, I mean, the, lot, the job that I had before this, I detested so much. It right. just was not right. It wasn't the right fit. And I was working really, really hard for somebody else without any gratitude from him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely doing what I was hired for. It was making him a yep. lot of money. Yeah. And you get to this place where you're like, okay, you know, if I'm going to work this hard and I'm going to stay and I'm going to get up at three o'clock in the morning and do a presentation for overseas, I want to do it for something that I really right. will get down on my knees for. Yeah. And yeah. it's a blessing. Everything brings you to that place that you're supposed to be because even though that previous job wasn't anything like... I mean, it was it was really miserable for me. Mm -hmm. It served me so well. Right. Down to the boss that I had, like, he was the best teacher because it was taught me what I don't want it to do as a business owner. And it also taught me to not be so judgmental of him in many ways, too, after the fact, you know, because there are some really hard things as a business owner you have to do. So everything is this little window into where you're meant to be. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So Just Be Kitchen was birthed out of... A passion of yours, right? Oh, cool. yeah. yeah. I mean, in in a class in a in the MBA classrooms, you Beautiful. know. Beautiful, cool, very cool. I was also I was also doing some um, semi-competitive sports 
you know, in, in England, I was doing touch rugby mm-hmm. and was really, really struggling on the pitch from a performance because I'd gone to be a vegan mm-hmm. and I had gained weight and I just wasn't feeling great. And right. so also at the same time, a holistic nutritionist started to have me incorporate animal protein and kind of put me on a paleo-ish di- diet, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't called a diet and it wasn't called paleo at the time. Right. Um, but that's, that's how I started eating. And so I was just floored because I snapped my ACL right as I was like four months into this new lifestyle and new way of eating. And my, my leg did not blow up. It didn't get, it didn't get swollen really because I had no inflammatory foods in my body. And so then I was hooked. Cool. Yeah. So that's, that's then kind of the impetus then for the gluten grain and refined sugar free because those foods for the majority of people cause inflammation and Correct. cause a, a lot of other issues. So that, so kind of that experience, maybe a little, you could call it a crossroads in your life. You got injured, but at the time you were, you were eating, um, super clean, super clean and, and just going through that type of transition in your own life with the diet and stuff. And you realize like, Hey, I got, I just had this serious injury. I'm eating super clean. I'm, I'm eating these non-inflammatory foods. And I see because I'm eating this way, this injury that is pretty bad, but I, I'm not having some of that inflammation. I'm not having some of those severe side effects that other people that maybe aren't eating as well would, would experience, right? Yeah. So that's then kind of how you came to incorporate the gluten, grain, and refined sugar-free foods into into Just Be, right? Yeah. Okay, totally. cool. Very cool. Very cool. So again, it's just like a domino effect. Everything, when you're pursuing your passion, when you're focused on what you know you love, then it then all it, starts to happen it, and it come together just, and yep, it flows. Absolutely. Cool. Very cool. Now, um, let's... Uh, I want to talk about, before we get back into um, kind of more of the business stuff, I I do want to touch on, because you mentioned competitive sports um, when you were overseas and things like that. I know when I uh, read your bio on your website, um, you mentioned CrossFit, cycle bar, and hiking. So, Jen, why don't you just share with the listener how physical movement, exercise how that is an outlet for you and how that is helping you currently as as an entrepreneur so one of the things that i find awesome about movement is whether it's yoga whether it's crossfit whether it's i mean hiking i hiking i feel like is in a different category right because you're with nature (laughs) and i don't there's a better place to be Mm -hmm. but anyways the, the movement of your body, the greatest thing about it is it allows you to be fully present because you right. have to focus on what you're doing in that moment. And so from a business owner's perspective, if I go for a while without any kind of movement, and there might just be days when I'm so busy I can only do a 6.30 yoga class. Okay. Um, I've also had to really change a lot of my, you know, I used to CrossFit hard. Mm-hmm. And I've had to really change that since opening a business. I My adrenals are fatigued. Um, the stress, you know, and so you, I've had to really simmer down. Um, but no matter what I'm doing, I do a lot of Fierce 45 now too, you're just present. And so all the overwhelm of being an entrepreneur and the business and everything, you have to put out the, you leave it at the door when you go into that fitness studio and focus exactly on where your body is moving. And that's why I love it so much. Cool. I used to love it for the hard for the, for the physical demand of my body. Right. And I love that my body can do things and I'm very grateful, although I feel like it's, you know, I get fatigued a lot easier now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love it because your mind has to be present in that moment. Right. Now you mentioned, uh, is it Fierce 45? Yeah, what's, what's, what's that? I've never heard of it's, that. It's uh, Reformer Pilates, the oh, Green okay. Method. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. So it's great for, particularly if you're a woman out there and you've, you know, you're dealing with your female hormones and adrenals and stuff. It's great because it's low impact, but it it really has it does a doozy on your booty and other other muscles. Sweet. <laughs> that sounds good. All right, so what do you believe is your greatest strength? Oh, um, I. I I think what 
I would say at least it's something that I've I had to work on in the past and I feel like it's become a strength is a lot of compassion I'm, I'm an empath I've realized that I'm an empath I used to think that I was highly highly sensitive which I am but I now know that I feel deeply and so I have an ability to I think have a lot of compassion and understanding you know cool. for others around me beautiful even awesome. if it upsets me or even if I disagree or yeah mm -hmm. what is your I'm also greatest tenacious as hell <laughs> <laughs> you have to be to open up your own business right well, open up a restaurant, I think you have to have a crazy gene, but yeah, yeah, you do. And being an entrepreneur, I think you have to be tenacious. Absolutely. What is your greatest weakness? Um, probably that I am, that I, I think that's, I think it's my greatest strength is also my greatest weakness. Okay. You know, like I'm very sensitive. Mm -hmm. And when you take a business that is a piece of your heart and you put it out there in the world, and anyone comments about it, whether it's positive or even if it's, even if it's really positive, but you're like, but they say maybe a word that you're like, oh, really? This is, that's, that is positive. But you know, like you're just constantly analyzing it. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, negative feedback, of course, just crushes you like mm -hmm. a, like a Mack truck. Right. Um, right. And I, luckily I have a very good head chef and I have other people around me who are much able to like shrug stuff off right and I'm learning from that okay so I, I worked for quite a few years in a restaurant and I know that you know our restaurant was you know made a lot of money it was a great restaurant buffet restaurant things like that but you could do everything right you could have your food could be made exactly the way it's supposed to be made taste the way it's supposed to taste it's everything's dialed in mm -hmm you're still going to have a person or two come in every once in a while with some sort of negativity, some sort of complaint. They're going to, they're just, I don't know. It, they're just having that day and they're going to come in and they're going to let it all out on you or one of your employees. How do you, as a business owner, how do you deal with somebody who brings in the negativity into the positive space that you're trying to create in, in your business? How do you deal with somebody that maybe is negative towards you or is negative towards one of your employees? So the interesting part is that we're very, I, I'm going to handle, I'll answer this twofold. So okay. we're very, very lucky because we have so many customers that are so full of gratitude, like genuine gratitude. They tell us that in person, et cetera. Um, I don't have that many customers who are visibly upset when they come into the right. store. Yes, that happens, but I love that. Communicate with me. You, you tell me your truth, I'll go ahead and make that better. Mm -hmm. um, what's really hard is when it's the, it's the no-name profiles or the DMs on Instagram that I get. You know, like, those are the hard ones. Um, and I've started to, you know, really, like, communicate to them usually privately, but sometimes in their, if it's a public comment, but if they're direct messaging me on Instagram, you know, I'll respond and, you know, and I'll just try to give them some, some, some of our perspective, you know, and then there's, and then I just wrote a blog post about this. Then there's comments that you don't need to respond to. Right. You, that, that just don't deserve the response. You know, when you send me a DM and you say some negative things about my dogs, cause I put right. my dogs on Instagram, mm -hmm. like it doesn't even deserve a response mm -hmm. and I'm getting better at knowing that. Yeah. Good. So have you have have you yet experienced somebody who maybe brought in some negativity towards one of your employees or, or, or not necessarily haven't yeah, experienced that yet in, in the, we in the try, like restaurant. I always want like our manager me and my managers to shield any employees from any right. I mean we haven't had anybody in inside. There have been some like Yelp reviews that have said things like, you know, a barista was upset about giving a free coffee and and those kinds of things, I, I try not to, if it's, if it's, if it's really negative about an employee, like that I feel is unfounded, I usually will write back and say, you know, like, Hey, like a barista is not upset about giving you a free coffee. Right. They're probably nervous because they don't know how to put it into the POS, exactly. you right, know? Right. Um, and I don't, I, I will, I don't want to share stuff with employees that are not 
you know, pertinent mm-hmm. to, mm-hmm. to, you know, th- there's a way of saying things and there's a way not saying things. Mm-hmm. And we might get, we might get customers that would complain about, you know, an employee, the way that they perceived an employee acting in a certain way. Um, but you know, nine times out of 10, I did have someone say that my team watched them fall on the ground and laugh at them. And I was like, my team would never do that. You know, it just, that just wouldn't happen. There's nobody here that's going to do that. And there's very few people in life who are going to do that, right. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll completely stick up, you know, for the team on that. But also, like, there's not, there's certain things. Most of the time, customers have a misperception of how an employee is handled. Usually, these are, these are kids that are not trained to do a conflict management. That's not their job. And they're usually, if they can't service somebody well, it's usually because they're nervous or you know, unsure about what to do. It's it's not because they don't want to. I mean, I can tell you that. They all really want to do their job really well. And they, most of the time they do. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. So it's usually just a perception. But I hate, I really hate focusing on this so much because I just wrote a blog post about how there's too much time given to those negative things. Mm-hmm. And there's so much positivity that comes and so much gratitude that come from guests. And, and Instagram and all in social media channels and everything. And that's really what I'm making a conscious choice to focus on more. Yeah. And, and you, you're doing a great job. So mm-hmm. keep Thanks. it up for sure. Now, in regards to like hiring employees, what is a trait or traits that you really are looking for when you are trying to get somebody to fit into the community or the team that, that you have here at Just Be Kitchen? So co- hiring on culture, you know, people always tell you, hire on culture. And, you know, when you're in the, it's a tough labor market out there. And so we've, we've had waves of where we're like, we just need to hire, you know, and, and we don't hire on culture and it does bite us in the ass. Um, but I think it's, <laughs> you know, I have, I have a phenomenal head chef who is very rare because he doesn't scream and yell and pound stuff. And that's, you know, I've also said, like, I don't want that to be our culture. Right. I don't want there to be a culture of Gordon Ramsay slamming stuff, shaming and blaming and stuff. Um, so we try to hire on culture. We used to go through a little bit more of a thorough process. Sometimes it's hard when you're trying to hire quickly. But we do often ask, like I just had the team go through a values exercise where I wanted all the management team to choose the values that they want to live by. And in an ideal world and with every hire, we would look at, you know, who we're hiring and say, okay, do they, what are their values? And it doesn't have to necessarily align directly to the company values, but are the values that they have inherent values that we want people to display and that we want people to demonstrate to customers? Do we want them to own those and hold each other accountable to those? And that's that's more kind of like what we go for. Okay. You know. What does integrity mean to you personally? Oh, that's one of my. So when we just pulled, we did our values. You know, I shared with the team that integrity and courage are my two values. Um, integrity means to me so much. It's just it's so at the core of everything, and. It often means like not not always being right, but doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Just doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, it means loyalty. It means trust to me. It means truth. Cool. No, that's that's yeah. great. Thank you. I think in, you you cannot have a team or a true positive culture with without integrity, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's a big trigger. So I just had, I literally, our last team meeting, our last management team meeting, that's what we talked about, is that, you know, for me, I chose my values based on the things that also get me triggered. So I get really upset when I feel people haven't displayed integrity mm-hmm. in the way that I believe good integrity is. Um, and it is also something, so I always say that, like, integrity for me is as a value brings me to my knees like I feel so grateful when I see people demonstrating integrity and when I demonstrate integrity like it feels so good and then conversely it's also something that really triggers me when there's been a lack of integrity Mm -hmm. Um, either where I feel like I've been out of integrity I it swims through my mind and I might contact in someone 
and say, you know, I feel like I might have been out of integrity on this, you know, and it sits in me. So it's so it's those things that kind of sit in you and stew in you if you're not living it. Or if other people may not have been demonstrating it, it it's something that brings you brings you to your knees and brings it to your eyes. Right, you know? right. What, what does uh, communication mean to you in terms of your life personally, but then also being in charge of other people in the sense of you have employees and you have people working underneath you? Is communication one of those absolutely 100% important things for, for you personally and then for your, your it's business? It's very important for me personally and for the business. I would say it's really difficult. So there's a couple levels of communication, right? The tactical components of making sure that things are communicated effectively throughout the business is really hard. In a, Actually, it, I felt like it used to be a lot easier when I was in the corporate world because everyone's chained to a desk on email or instant messenger. In the restaurant business, that's not the case and communication flow is a constant challenge just to make sure that everybody's on board with, you know, we might be out of this or low on this or da, 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 you know, whatever, this has changed. So that kind of communication is just an all, always a challenge. But in terms of communicating and, you know, speaking the truth, I do try, I do try to, I feel like I really try to communicate the importance of that with particularly the wider team, but definitely my management team. Um, I think that what I've what I've really realized as a business owner is not everybody has the same capacity for the truth that you do. And that doesn't mean that they're bad people or anything like that. It's that communi- we're all on different spectrums of communication. And for me, it's very easy to have a very open conversation about something we might disagree on. For other people, that's a really difficult mechanism to do particularly when you're looking at, you know, maybe a more junior employee with a more senior employee. And so the, the best that I feel like you could do is just to foster that, like, you know, if you, if you are open and you communicate, that's okay. You know, I'd rather people say things than not say things. Right. How it's said is often very different, right? Sorry. Um, but I would like to think that, you know, in the, in the utopia, what I would really love is that everybody has the comfort level to communicate openly mm-hmm. about things. Okay, cool. What's What's been the biggest lesson that you've learned in this uh, experience or journey that you're on of entrepreneurship? The biggest thing that I've learned? Yeah, like the biggest the, the biggest lesson so far, something that you've just like maybe... You can't you, do it all. You can't do it all? Okay. Yeah. What what's what's what what, what does that mean? Explain yeah. that a little bit. I mean, I I kind of know what it means, but just for you personally, what does yeah. what does that look like? So, I guess two things. You can't do it all, and it's better to have progress versus perfection. Um, I know that I have you know stalled on a lot of things because I want them to be perfect. I feel like a sense of like. Uh, it's a responsibility that I have to make sure that everything that gets sent out to employees or everything that gets sent out to customers has to be uber, uber perfect. And actually what people really want is they just want to see something that comes out, you know, whether it's, you know, it is just whatever it might be. It might be a, an organizational announcement. It might be a new process. It might be marketing whatever it is. It just, it's better to take the action and to do it, and then you can always refine and do a redo, but progress over perfection is better all the time. The other thing that, in terms of you can't do it all, there's all of these people that work really fucking hard mm-hmm. all the time. And I, there's just no way I could do it on my own. Right. And you have to start releasing things that you don't feel comfortable letting go of, but you also know that you have to let go to move on. Right. Um, it was really funny this morning I got here, and this is just a small example, but I saw um, Chase out in the parking lot, and I was like, hey, you know, he had yesterday off, and when he has Saturdays off, we kind of, I take the piss out of him for mm-hmm. having Saturdays off, um, just as a joke, because we never get weekends off. Right, so right, you know no, I, mean? I got you. Yeah. So, um, so I was teasing him, and he was like, well, I was actually, I did a little work and I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, I picked up a refrigerator, the, the refrigerator. 
And long story short, my operations manager, we needed to get another refrigerator downstairs, and they just sorted the whole thing out between them, and I wasn't even a part of it. And that is such a huge step. Like, it sounds so small, but to not even have been a part of the process is great. Like, there's movement, there's progress, they're doing it. I don't need to be involved in that. I trust them. And it's fantastic. And cool. and you just have to know that you just got to let go of some stuff and trust it's going to happen. Awesome. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. So why uh, why why Denver, Colorado for Just Be Kitchen? And, <laughs> and, and I'm sure that ties into like, well, let's, let's talk about why you moved to Denver, if you don't mind, yeah. and then why you decided to open up Just Be Kitchen in Denver. So I basically was living in London, England, and I decided I wanted to move out to the States and I wanted to choose a city that Just Be Kitchen could thrive in. And I looked, you know, like at, I I knew I did not want to live, I didn't want to live in like San Francisco or New York or LA. I didn't want to live in a big city. I'd been in a big city for long enough. And um, so I started looking up tier two cities and I'd never been to Denver and I'd never been to Portland. And I saw that they were both progressive demographics and healthy, you know, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, okay, that's great for the business. And then it was like, well, what's Jen's needs? And Jen needed to be 20 I decided I wanted to be able to hike and go to brunch on the same day. And that I wanted – I needed two seasons because I had been in London where there was, like, one season, which is all gray. And I was like, I don't need four seasons, but I can take two. And so I narrowed down the checklist then, and then I basically, you know, it came, kept whittling down. I was like, Denver and Portland, that's where I'm going to move to one of those cities. So I came and spent basically two weeks here, and then two weeks there in the summer, and two weeks here in the winter, and two weeks there in the winter, and I just decided Denver. Cool. Cool. And then, uh, so once you moved here then, did you move here as part of another company, and then kind of the Just Be Kitchen thing? birth or how to, how to, yeah. How so I work? tried to quit my job in London and move here. And he was like, well, you know, I was a shareholder and partner in the company. And he was like, well, why don't you just go to the States and open up the U S headquarters? And I was like, and I really, really didn't, you know, didn't, I really didn't want to do that. But then I thought, you know what, that could serve me really well. I'll move over. I don't have to worry about a paycheck. And I could work 5 a.m. to like 1 p.m. on UK time and then side hustle Just Be Kitchen in the afternoon. And that's basically what I did. You know, and when I moved over here, I was already really done with that job. But I just knew that it was serving me for the moment. Mm -hmm. So then you're you're working that job. You're here in Denver. How, How do you go from working that job to opening up Just Be Kitchen. What What is kind of the in-between with all of that? Well, th- I thought that I'd move here and be able to open up within, like, months, you know. And so <laughs> I started looking for real estate. And, you know, you're a nobody. And they want, you know, Frank Bonanno to take the spot rather than you. And you're right. like, okay. So I just had a really hard time finding a spot mm-hmm. and got really discouraged. I think I did 57 LOIs, which is letters of intent on different properties. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just, you, you know, it's like chicken and egg. You can't get financing without having a, a lease. You can't sign a lease without having financing. Right, <laughs> so, right. It all ties together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so then I was just kind of like, I just kept getting rejected from place after place after place. Um, and then I, you know, thought, okay, well, maybe it's not meant to happen. And then I'd get back into, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So during that time of uh, trying to figure out how you're going to find a place and the, all the real estate and all that type of stuff, how did you deal with that, like, personally with kind of all that rejection and, and discouragement? Was that – did you allow that to kind of – put you into a dark time or did you just really stay positive and just kind of keep rising above all, all of No, all of I really kept, it really kept, I think what the voices in your head are like, well, I guess this isn't meant to be, this isn't supposed to happen. And then I would keep going to like, okay, well, what other path am I going to do? And there was no other path that seemed as attractive to me. So then I would say, okay, well, I'll just go out there and do another lease like offer, you know, I just go up put another offer out here, put another offer out here. 
and you just keep getting rejected and you know and then I was really unhappy in my job at that time too and so it's just everything's kind of like spiraling and spiraling and spiraling and no I was not positive the whole time at all it would be a lie to say that I was mm -hmm. you know yeah 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 but you kept going because it was something that was that was I kept in, going, in your heart, right? Yeah, I kept going because I also just kept looking at what were the alternatives. I would even get like on job sites and be like, okay, well, let me look at a head, you know, a VP of marketing or president of marketing job, whatever. And I'm like, none of this sounds attractive. Like, no, so I guess I'd rather just keep doing this where I'm hitting walls than something else right you know yeah. like everything just seems soulless so I just kept going down the path and I'm cool. like well if I keep trying enough and, you know and you have to surround yourself with other business owners because they will tell you you know they get rejected all the time like it's terrible you do you mm -hmm. just you think that you're all like rejecting the dating world's hard like in the right. business world it's <laughs> like you know like oof. So if you surround yourself by enough people who've been through it, you kind of know you're not alone, even though you constantly feel alone. Mm -hmm. So what's uh, what's uh, one place or a couple places here in Denver or in the state of Colorado, if somebody was going to come here and visit that you would suggest that they check out? Just Be Kitchen is great. There you go. <laughs> Just Be Kitchen. Yep. Number one. <laughs> um well, you gotta go. You gotta go on hikes. Hikes, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you gotta do that. Is there like a specific place that you like to go hiking, or that yeah? You... But I don't want to say because then everyone's oh, gonna okay. go to this it's trail. Secret. That no it's a secret. On, you know, <laughs> um, there's so many trails. Ah, yeah, yeah, I know there is. Yeah, there is. Yeah, and Chicago Park in Boulder is great. Okay. I love that. I won't give out my secret trail. No, I don't want to. <laughs> Maybe you can tell me off when we turn off the podcast. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's just so much, and so you have to do that while you're here. Um, you should also probably check out, I don't know, you know, I feel like, I feel like, I love Uptown area. Okay. Like, I love Uptown, probably okay. hang out there, but, I don't know, Highlands. Okay, cool. No, that's cool, because I know... Everyone Colorado. says Red Rocks and stuff like that, which is fine, but I'd rather mm -hmm. just go hiking. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. I just know that Colorado, as a state... In, in general is just blown up. I mean, people are moving out here, but then... Oh, I would totally do the hike from Aspen to Crested Butte and okay. Crested Butte to Aspen back. Cool, cool, yeah. I know there's, I mean, there's so many people moving out here, but then so many people just come out here too to vacation. Yeah. So if a listener's out there coming to, after they check out Just Be Kitchen, then... Yeah, we're, we're... I've hiked all over the world, and the be one of the best, like I'd say top 10 hike is get yourself to Aspen, hike over to Crested Butte, and then spend a couple nights in Crested Butte and hike back. Great. All right. There you go, listeners. Check check that out when you guys come come visit. So um, let's uh, transition to just maybe talking about a person or people that have had the greatest impact on your life. And that could be professionally uh, as an entrepreneur or maybe just personally, if, if you don't mind sharing that, Jen. The people that have had the most impact on yeah, my like life? Yeah, like one person or a couple people that, that have just really had the greatest impact on your life as as, as, a, as a woman. Um, that I know personally? It, it doesn't or, have to be. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't have to be. They could be well, alive my, or not, what, whatever, however, whatever that looks like for you. So I think that when I started, I, I like it to say like when I started to awaken, um... I, I guess, so my, one of my, there's four of us that are best friends from childhood and one of the four of us, my best friend, Lena, um, has been on a journey like for decades now, um, of, you know, her, her greatest purpose. Right. And I think that probably because maybe I wasn't necessarily in that state of state of mind. I hadn't really appreciated all the all this healing work that she had been doing. And so when I started to awaken to the things that I really wanted and understanding the life that I wanted to choose for myself, um, here's this amazing, beautiful best friend that was this great vessel for me for all kinds of directions that I wanted to go mm -hmm. and to manifest the things that I really want in life. Yeah. Um, so Lena has definitely been an impact on my life a hundred percent um and then i would say you know more recently there was a, a coach that i worked with named nancy levin she's based in colorado 
who during some of my darkest times in 2015, which was a really tough year, um, she is she's a spiritual coach. She's um, a published author, works for Hay House. She's got a um, radio show. Um, and I worked with her both in a group setting and privately. And she has made a tremendous impact on my life. Awesome. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Now, um, t- spirituality, is that is that something that's uh, big in your life or plays a, a pretty big big role in, in your life? Yes. Cool. Yes. Cool. Awesome. And I think you can believe in anything you want. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, I really, I think everybody finds a spiritual path regardless of right. what they believe in. Um, I believe in God. However, I have, I feel like I have a closer relationship with God now that I am out of organized religion and more on a spiritual path. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you for sharing that. So let's um, talk about, I think you mentioned in the beginning of our discussion a, a book. I can't remember the name of it, but if you want to restate that book or give us a book or books that you gift often or that you would recommend to the listeners. Anything by Brene Brown. Brene Brown, okay. Oh, yes. Amazing. Okay. Um, the book I referenced was Eat, Pray, Love by Liz Gilbert. Okay. And she's amazing regardless anyways. Um, her, I think her latest one is Big Magic. Um, let's see. Oprah, Oprah has been huge for me. And I'm, I'm a big podcaster too. Okay. And if you're an entrepreneur, you should totally listen to NPR's How I Built This. How, how I Built how This? How I Built This. How I Built This, Okay. I am. I religiously wait for that to come out each week. Cool. Is there another podcast then that that you would like to recommend? Or, um, I listen to Lewis Howe's podcast. Um, School of Greatness. Yeah, I listen to that. I listen. I Tony's not doing as many podcasts, but I, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins. Um, there's actually God, why can't I remember the name of it? It's just this podcast has nothing to do with entrepreneurship or spiritual growth. It's called. Um, it's really great. It like uncovered the Watergate scandal, and they did the, the Clinton. So it's more like a political okay. podcast. Yeah. Um, it's so good. I'm waiting for the third season to come out. Okay, cool. And do you, do you listen to that? Like, is it through iTunes or is it through? Yeah, it's through. Okay. I listen to all of them through okay. iTunes. Um, and I just listened to a new one this morning from a, the the Gaia leadership, which was pretty good. Okay. Because um, I, I decided I needed to diversify a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, I, I was going to try to find that show for you, but I, I don't know why it's, oh, Slow Burn. Slow Burn is Slow great. Burn, okay. Yeah. Slow Burn by Slate. It's a great political one, okay. but it's not about the current political climate. It's about past. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of historical then. Yeah. Okay. Great. We, we touched on exercise a little bit and how that's kind of an outlet and very important in your life. We talked about the journaling and that's just a form of expression what is like self-care like when I say that kind of what is what pops up in your mind and how does self-care you personally taking care of yourself so that you can be the best version of yourself not only for you but for the people that are in your life what what does that look like overall outside of writing or journaling and and the physical activity maybe is there like a uh mental practice or you know quiet time breathing is there anything else in regards to self-care that that you want to share yeah so self-care for me is about really about making sure that my cup is full and the way for me that I have to do that and the greatest thing about this is that I have really communicated to my team that this practice of mine is important. So, you know, Chase, my head chef knows, other members of the management team know that in the morning, that's my self-care time. So I get up pretty much every day around 5.36. It took a while to get the business transitioned off of me during those hours so that I'm not contacted, you know. Um, And it's not really until like 8.39 that I kind of get on my computer. And so between those hours, um, I'm usually like, getting up with the dogs, snuggling with them, getting them fed. I have my decaffeinated coffee now. 
and I'll journal or I always do I, every morning I do movement okay um, I, I'll do um, you know stretching and stuff like that um, then I might go work out afterwards I might listen to a podcast and walk the dogs but I really have those two and a half hours that's really about gen time cool um, and if I don't get that if something just you know happens where I either have an early meeting or get jolted I definitely feel off balance for the day um, but I do make that a daily practice you know I might meditate it's it's a little bit different it's a little bit of the same every morning but it's a little bit of the different you know like mobility always gets done pretty much because my body just needs that now mm -hmm. um, but you know just there might be some mornings I might journal some mornings I might listen to the podcast okay cool yeah um, as as a as a female as a woman who is an entrepreneur and been in the business world have you seen is is there because I, I hear different things you know because you know in some uh, realms like it's very male dominated as opposed to you know females and then vice versa have you experienced anything I don't want to say negativity but have there been some obstacles that you've had to overcome as a businesswoman in the business world, being an entrepreneur because you are a woman, have you have you experienced maybe some some struggles or obstacles be because of that? You know, I'm. I will say, I am pretty sure. I have to be really careful about how I word this because I am not a victim of anything. Right. Right. With that said, I definitely know, and it's really only if you're a woman do you do you really know this. Mm -hmm. You know, no offense. No, no, that's not. But I, you know, I've had bankers say to me. I had one banker say to me as I was going through, you know, trying to get a loan. Um, but you're single. Your husband can't support you. You don't have a husband to support you. You know, and I'm like, are you effing kidding me? Right, right. Um, you know, tell me who would say to a man. Who would ever say to a man, you know, well, you're just single male. You, your wife isn't here to support you on this loan. Like you would, it just wouldn't happen. Right. Right. You know? So yes, I had that said to me, granted it was one banker out of many, but mm -hmm. I also think that, you know, statistically it's proven that women do have a harder time finding funding. Um, I, you know, I think with the real estate, um, I definitely had one situation in particular where if you know the chef that I had starting off was female that if she and I had been male or one of us male or hit her if she had been you know male we would have gotten a, a particular spot I think the landlord was very biased at that point just certain things that he said um, so yeah you know like you feel it at times 100% um, often too sometimes some guests don't think that I'm the owner you know, you know, they just, they just don't. And yeah. that's, that's okay. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't think people are malicious. It's just ingrained in society. Yeah, and I sure. definitely don't think that I'm a victim. Right. Right. Um, but there is a bias. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to, we're, we're going to wrap things up here. We've been going for almost an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. Sure. Um, when I came in to the restaurant, uh, earlier today, I noticed that you were out on the floor, you were serving your customers, you were intricately involved in what was going on. You weren't just like in the back in a room, sitting at your desk or anything like that. What is what is what does that mean to you to be serving amongst your employees and interacting with uh, your customers and just you know, obviously you don't have a name tag or anything saying, Hey, I'm the owner or whatever, but what, what does it mean to you and what's what's the value and the importance to you to be involved intricately in serving and communicating with with your with your guests so first of all I love so I think it's important that I understand the operations like because it's really I often don't necessarily if I didn't do it I wouldn't know how employees would feel and I wouldn't know how guests would feel about certain things Weekends, I love being on the floor. Weekdays, I need to be behind my desk, okay. uh, you know, mm -hmm. just to get stuff done. Yeah. But the weekends, like, I feel like I need to know what's happening operationally to see how my guests are feeling, to see how my employees are feeling. You know, there's just certain things, like even today, you know, you identify something. So I said to my man, my operations manager, I'm like, I think we need, it's a little hard on the team for a 
we, you know, the way we do shifts is we stagger, but a good chunk come in at noon. So the morning crew is kind of struggling. Well, I was in at nine, so I was part of that morning crew. And I was like, I think this is a little hard on the morning crew. You know, it's it can get pretty busy. We need to give them more support. So if I don't see those things, then I don't know. But I also get a buzz being here on the weekends when we're busy. When we're not so busy, it's way better for me to be behind right, the desk because right, I yep. get anxiety. So, but it's fun. You know, it's really fun. Cool. And then I get to, you know, be part of training. Um, although there's other people here that are way better trainers than I am, <laughs> but you know, so I get to be a part of it and I like to see how that goes. Awesome. No, that's, that's great. Cause I know when I worked in the restaurant business, we had like, we had a main owner of the business and then there were some, uh, co-owners and all of that. The only one that didn't work in the store was the main owner of the, of the, of the restaurant. Everybody else that owned it and managers, management were in the store but what I'm trying to say is one of the co-owners always sat in the back on, on the in, in, in the desk on the computer and he was he had the the gift of number crunching I understand all that but then we had the other co-owner manager he was out on the floor he's interacting with the customers and it's just I think it's really valuable and very important for customers and getting that retention to say, hey, you know what, this this is one of the owners of this business and they are taking the time out of their obviously busy schedule to come talk to me or greet me mm -hmm. or even serve food. So I, I just think mm -hmm. my experience in the restaurant business, when you have somebody that is actually an owner or the owner who is actually on the floor interacting, serving, that is, that is a very powerful statement. That And that's just from my own personal experience. So when I saw that coming in today and you came up and I was sitting there and we'd never met face to face mm. before this. And you said, Hey, have you ever been in here? And I'm like, no, that, that, that was just really powerful and really cool to see you doing that. So oh, um, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Not a problem. No, I love it. I have so much fun. I, you know, this being on the floor is not my wheelhouse. You know, I, I love the finances and the HR and the marketing and that's all kind of back end stuff. And that's where I, those, those really where my strengths are. Mm -hmm. Um, there are people who understand operations and do operations way better than I do, but I love being on there and I love, and I, and when I say operations, like I know what my business is today, but like as we scale and grow, like from a broader perspective of operations, there are people right. who do that better than me. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does give me a buzz for sure. Awesome. So I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to wrap things up here. I've got two more, two more quick questions for you. What, what is the future in your heart? Where do you want to take Just Be Kitchen? Do you, do you want to just make it the best restaurant in regards to this location? Are you looking to hopefully expand in the we future? We want to be what? the Chipotle of gluten-free. Okay, cool. All right. So, yeah. so like franchises and expansion? Maybe not franchise. I don't know about that because of the okay. integrity of our brand okay. and stuff. Okay. But I definitely mm -hmm. want to scale. And, you know, it's too important to me to ensure that people have access to food like this mm -hmm. um, and that it's at a price point that's accessible to the masses. Right. And having, it's too much hard freaking work for one location. Right, right. Um, it's just too hard to do one location. Mm -hmm. But the, the reason why I did this is because I felt like this kind of food was only accessible at a farm to table kind of premium price. And I wanted something that was much more accessible to the masses and you could have ex more accessible. Cool. Last last question. What does legacy mean to you? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I just want to. I I just want. Oh, it kind of that just kind of got me a little teary. Um, I just want people to be as proud of this as I am. Beautiful. sharing it cool awesome I mean that, that's it's it's so beautiful Jen because this this is this is your passion project like this is what is deep like I've said in the past this is what's deep in your heart deep within your soul and and this this is who you are mm -hmm. so you want people to, to come along and yeah, be a part I mean, of that I guess, right yeah I mean I think I was just thinking about it a little bit more as we were talking but I really I want someone to I want there to be people that love this as much as I do yeah. and can you know if we want to grow i want them to to run you know one of the units i want mm -hmm. them to to live the values i want them 
it can't all just be me. So nope. if I can pass that legacy and that vision and that desire onto others, then that'd be awesome. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I just want to thank you, Jen, um, for taking time out of your busy schedule to hang out with me. Thank you. And I just want to thank you for being um, a strong leader, a strong example, uh, a strong woman, a strong uh, business person. And uh, I just want to thank you for the positivity that you have created at, at Just Be Kitchen. Because like thank I've said you. several times um, before in, in, in this conversation, um, a couple people that I've reached out to to be guests on, on my podcast, when I mentioned Just Be Kitchen and possibly meeting up here to do an interview or do a podcast, they, they've had nothing but uh, positive and great things to say. So thank so you. thank you for that what you're doing and, and thank you for the positivity that you're you're bringing into 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 this restaurant and into, into people's lives. So thank you. Yeah, That's so you're, kind. You're very welcome. So I just want to give you an opportunity right now, Jen, as we as we close here, um, to share if you want to share your Instagram handle, website. If somebody um, has been impacted, which I know there's going to be people that are going to be impacted through you sharing your story, if they want to reach out to you. Where, where can people find you or, or get a hold of you if they'd like? Yeah, totally. So our Instagram handle is at just, be, uh, actually our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter handles are all at Just Be Kitchen. All the messages come straight to me. Um, our website is justbekitchen.com, and all the messages on there come straight to me too. Okay. And my email is on there, just be you at justbekitchen.com. That comes to me, and I'll keep my phone number to myself. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And I can I can vouch for the fact that um, if you send Jen a direct message, um, she will she will get back. I think I sent you a message and uh, early in the morning because I get up pretty early, and then by that afternoon we had this set up for this this <laughs> Sunday, and so. You, uh, I'm you not always that quick, though. You, uh, you, like, take, you take care of your business, though. I was like, whoa, this, is, this, this, went, this no. went fast. So, but. It depends on where the the ones that are new. Like, I don't know. Sometimes right. it goes crazy. Yeah, depends well, I know you day. said when I sent you a message on Instagram, you said, hey, here's the, here's the email. email. Send me an email because the Instagram stuff gets crazy, yeah, which yeah. I'm sure it probably can. So, <laughs> All right. So, um, listeners, if you want to reach out to me, which I would greatly appreciate any feedback that you would have for me, you can... Um, find me on Instagram at 127 Fitness. Facebook is at Quentin Vars. And then I also have the at 127 Fitness Facebook page. Website, which is just uh, my personal blogs and some of my, my writings, some of the things that are in my heart and deep within my soul. You can find all of that at 127fitness.com. And please like, subscribe, share, and most importantly, leave a review that really helps out especially with um, iTunes and um, things of that nature and then um, if you would be interested in being a guest or again feedback anything like that or if you think you might have a, a guest or a friend or something that would be a good fit for the 127 fit podcast please feel free to email me um, that email is 127 fit at gmail.com and I just want to thank all of you listeners for hanging out with Jen and myself today and taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to listen um, to, to this podcast. So I am going to send you guys out today with Proverbs 2410, which states, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Until next time, I'll catch you guys later.